Patrick Harker joins us now exclusively by phone. President Harker, thank you so much for phoning in. Oh, thank it's you, Sarah. Thanks here. for having me. First, on those shockingly horrible jobless claims numbers that we got again today, how do you think about how many of those millions of job losses are temporary and could come back when the economy reopens, and how many of them are just lost for good? Yeah, so we don't know. It's a little too early to tell, uh, to an give an exact answer to that. But it's clear that a lot this unprecedented shock to the system, a non-financial shock, has caused a lot of dislocation in our economy and in our society. So we don't know that answer. I, mean, I think many of those jobs, I would say the majority, my instinct would tell me, are going to come back. But in some cases, slowly, as we reopen slowly. We'll talk about the reopening, but just as far as what uh, New York Fed President Williams said, that the Fed's job is not done. When it comes to boosting the economy, I mean, you guys are already at rock bottom zero interest rates with an open-ended quantitative easing. What else can the Fed do to help the economy? So I think there's two things we can do, and uh, I agree with my colleague, John. One is we've put a lot in place in terms of creating uh, facilities that bring the liquidity we need to have the markets function. We just need to continue to execute on those right, and make sure that if we need to tweak them, we tweak them to bring those markets back to functioning. We're not going to bring them back to where they were. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is a crisis. But we can help those markets to function. And once they function, the economy, as it starts to climb out of this health crisis, uh, can do that in the most of efficient and, and quickest way possible. How, how unpalatable was it, uh, President Harker, to you and some of your colleagues uh, enacting or, or approving some of the measures the Fed has gone as far as doing already, when I think of buying uh, non-investment grade bonds, for example, e even though you, you thought that was necessary, was it quite unpalatable to have to go that far? No, I don't think so. Not for me. I can only speak for myself, obviously. But no, I mean, we are faced with a situation we simply have never faced before, where the entire country is doing the right thing in terms of trying to contain this virus. But it has terrible effects on individuals, small businesses, and all, really all across the economy. So these are emergency measures, and these won't last forever. As we start to climb out of this, as we're able in a prudent fashion to unwind these measures, we will. But we had to do what we needed to do to bring the markets back to functioning. Um, you, you said to Sarah that you felt you, your instinct uh, told you that the uh, unemployment spikes we've seen of late would be temporary. What, what gives you uh, the hope or the confidence that, that that's the case? And how worried are you that we've seen such a big spike uh, already when some of these programs, like the PPP lending program, were at least in part designed to try and prevent that spike in the first place? Yeah, and so that is really a choice that individuals make in terms of unemployment versus uh, PPP. Again, that is playing out in terms of people and individuals, firms making choices there. But what we see, for example, let's use Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania had the largest spike of unemployment claims early on. The rest of the states have now caught up. Why? Well, one of the reasons is uh, Governor Wolf in Pennsylvania stopped all but life-sustaining construction very quickly. So a lot of construction workers applied for unemployment. I believe, coming from a family of construction workers, that when those jobs are able to, you know, you can get back on the job, people are going to do that pretty quickly because those construction projects need to get done. So I think throughout the economy, there will be others, like restaurants and so forth, they'll be slower to open. But I'm confident that a lot of the projects that were in train we're going to just get back on those and get them done. And those jobs will come back. So, so we are talking a lot about the, the reopening. Some of your colleagues at the Fed lately have talked about the need for more testing to get the recovery on track and consumer confidence up. How do you envision this needs to happen to get the economy working again? Yeah, so the way I think about it, and we've been partnering with some leading epidemiologists to think about this, it's going to vary by geography and by sector of the economy. So one can imagine, you know, a 
sectors of the economy where you can easily create social distancing, like in some manufacturing plants and so forth, coming online before, say, large gatherings, which will probably be the last thing that will come online. And that will vary by geography as this virus sweeps through the nation. It's not sweeping through all at once. It's sweeping through different communities at different times. So I think here, if we're prudent and we avoid doing it too quickly, because the lesson we're learning, say, from Singapore, is that if you try to do this potentially too quickly, you can get that second wave, and then you have to reverse course. It's better not to reverse course. So how quickly can that happen, according to your conversations at the Philly Fed? And, and what shape are we talking about? We mentioned earlier that James Gorman and Morgan Stanley says a V doesn't look realistic. Is there still hope for that? Yes, sir. So everybody likes letters, and I tried to use Greek letters, but I gave up. Uh, the, the, I think it really is more of a uh, – we're going to hit a, a period where it's going to be pretty bad, and we're, it's pretty bad right now, and your hearts go out to the people all across the country. And we will climb out of it. It's not going to be a sudden bounce back. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me that there are going to be certain industries like travel and tourism uh, and hospitality and so forth that will take some time to recover. And what we found through our research at the Philly Fed, and we're launching a series of reports, the first one was this week, on how this is impacting low-income communities. This report this week was on who's being impacted next week, the small businesses who are being impacted in a third of the communities, the actual geographies that are being impacted. And what you know is the disproportionate hit on the economy are with low-income people right now who lost that job at the restaurant or in other service industries. Um, President Harker, uh, I've been on all the bank's earnings calls uh, that Sarah referenced, uh, uh, James Gorman and Morgan Stanley this morning. It's a pretty uh, downbeat outlook for the economy. They're all increasing their reserves for potential bad loans. Yet on the flip side, recommitting to their dividends. Uh, this morning in the Financial Times, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari uh, wrote that he thought those dividends should all be suspended and even that the banks should seize the moment to raise extra capital uh, right now while they can. Well, where do you stand on, on that debate for the banks? So I do think that this is a time where if the banks are anticipating uh, significant losses, potential losses going forward, it is time to make sure that their storehouse is full of capital uh, to withstand uh, that bad time. So I'm supportive of the idea that broadly defined that they both retain and possibly uh, build those capital reserves. So, so on the dividends, will, will you be pushing uh, Fed Chair and, and your colleagues to tell the banks to do that? Because uh, my reading of, of all the commentary we've got out of the banks in the last uh, couple of weeks and, in fact, how, how the buyback suspension came about was it, it'll need, if not a, an explicit uh, instruction from the Fed, it'll need kind of quite a big push and a, a hint and a nudge in that direction to say, guys, Cancel the dividends for now. No, so that's obviously up to the Board of Governors working uh, in concert to, to decide what that policy is. And what, I, what I believe is it's a complicated issue because those dividends go somewhere, and often, particularly in, in people living on fixed income, they rely on those dividends. So this is where it's not just an easy decision to make, but I do think more broadly than just dividends, banks should fill their storehouse full of capital to get through this period. You mentioned, uh, President Harker, a few moments ago about how many extraordinary programs the Fed has put in place to keep markets functioning and the entire financial system functioning better. And, and we have seen improvement on that front after you guys stepped into everything from the munis to treasuries, the funding markets, the credit markets. How tentative of, of the re is the rebound right now? I mean, clearly people have started buying since the Fed has been buying, but how solid does that look to you at this point? And, and is there a limit to as far as you can go here? Yeah, so we're still in early days, so you know, this will play out over time. But I, it gives me uh, some comfort that we are starting to see these markets back to functioning. So I do think we have committed to doing what it takes to get us through this period in American history and the American economy. And so I'm fully committed to that. There are some complaints, though, already, and Wilfred alluded to this, that the Fed, you know, by going into junk-rated debt, essentially is, is rewarding companies for taking risky behavior. How, how are you planning to defend the Fed against those kind of criticisms? 
So first and foremost, we're not trying to pick winners and losers in this. We're trying to get markets functioning, right? I think that we have to say that very loud and clear. This is that's not uh, our role. But the reality is, uh, through the commercial paper facility, even if we're investing in investment grade. Uh, corporate bonds, some of those will be downgraded. So we have to be prepared uh, to deal with those securities over time. Um, President Harker, we mentioned how hard it is to pick what shape uh, letter the recovery is going to be, but can you uh, give us a, a broad estimate for the time frame of it? Do you think all of 2020, all of 21, perhaps 22, that we're unlikely to see uh, the federal funds uh, rate increase again? Well, I think in terms of uh, monetary policy, we're going to stay low for until we really see the economy starting to recover back to our dual mandate. Exactly how long that is, this is really a function of how quickly medical science can, and industry can put in place the tools, as you were talking about earlier, the testing regimes, uh, the vaccine, et cetera, uh, to keep the American public safe. The worst thing we can do, is, in my mind, is rush this. And we're in a situation there then where we could have a rebound, a significant rebound of COVID-19, which would just set us back. We need to do this in a way that keeps the American public safe and gets us out of this economic hole as prudently and as quickly as possible. Patrick Hawker, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.